Okay, we are all here. Can you hear me and see me all right? Excellent, good. Um, so I want to take this moment to welcome everybody to our first third Thursday of the fall 2021 semester. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Deborah Thomas. I'm a professor of anthropology here at UPenn and the director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography. Uh, this year, uh, our fourth year of existence, our theme is hyperfictions, hyperrealism. And we are welcoming four fellows to join us on campus. Uh, this semester, we have Ricardo Braccio, Cristiana Giordano, and Greg Parati, whom I will introduce in a moment. And next semester, we'll be joined by Amitav Ghosh, who will be working with Brooke O'Hara and Ali Sethi to stage a musical version. Morning in progress. Of his, of his new parable, parable Jungle Nam, um, and that we'll have more information about that soon. Uh, before we sort of dig into uh, introducing this semester's fellows, I also want to direct your attention to a couple of upcoming events that we're sponsoring. The first of these is next Thursday. It's the second to last webinar in our series that's being recording in progress. Today that's being hosted by the Venner Gren Foundation and co-sponsored by the Association of Black Anthropologists and Anthropology Southern Africa. Uh, and the, the series is called Toward a Radical Humanism in Anthropology. And the installment next Thursday is called Ethnographic Praxis, Relationality, Multimodality. And it's being co-organized with the Transformative Memory Project at UBC in uh, Canada. And during the webinar, uh, the panelists, all of whom use a creative practice in their own work, um, they're going to reflect on aesthetic engagements as collaborative ways of being and knowing. And uh, as collaborative ways of being and knowing, they will also talk about uh, how they unsettle established canons and also challenge the institutional and epistemic violences that undergird conventional knowledge production practices. Uh, the last webinar in that series will be in November and it will address the theme of extraction broadly. Uh, it's going to be co-sponsored by uh, the Association of Brazilian Anthropologists and we will have more information about that on our website soon. The second event that I want to alert you to is the conference that we uh, have co-sponsored with the Penn Museum titled Settler Colonialism, Slavery and the Problem of Decolonizing Museums. And this will take place mostly virtually the 20th to 23rd of October, but there will also be some in-person evening events for those of you who are in Philadelphia and feel comfortable coming out. Those events will also be live streamed. Uh, this conference is designed to join the, the North American conversations related to settler colonialism, repatriation, and NAGPRA to those that are somewhat more uh, robust in Europe and South Africa regarding imperialism and slavery. Um, and we want to bring these two sets of questions together in order to address uh, the, you know, to ask the question of what is the place of the ethnographic museum in today's world. Um, People are gonna be probing questions about accountability, about repair, about the legacies of scientific racism and beyond. And you can register and find out more on the conference website, which is www.decolonizingmuseums.com. And I'll put that in the chat um, shortly. Okay, so now to our agenda for today. As you know, these third Thursday gatherings are really an opportunity to gather. Uh, informally and talk about works in progress or emergent issues or upcoming opportunities. And our first third Thursday each semester is dedicated to meeting our fellows and hearing more about their work and their classes. So let me just take a, a minute to introduce them and then they will each uh, speak for a little while and then we can open it up to broad questions. Ricardo Bracho is a playwright, performer, and producer, dramaturg, and filmmaker who has a committed focus on working with feminist, queer, Latina, and Latino community-based and experimental theaters. 
His plays, which include The Sweetest Hangover, Sissy, Mexican Psychotic, and Puto, have been staged, uh, read, workshopped, and premiered in theaters and at universities nationwide. His past academic appointments include artist and scholar in residence at the Center for Chicano Studies at UC Santa Barbara and the multicultural faculty position at the theater school at DePaul University, and of course, with us here at Penn as the visiting artist with the program in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. Ricardo began his theater career some 30 years ago as assistant director to Sherry Moraga's Drama Divas, a writing for performance workshop for queer and trans youth of color. And uh, he was also a co-founder of Proyecto Contra Sida, Por Vida, a San Francisco-based Latina uh, Latino LGBT HIV service agency. He's worked on curricula, media campaigns, research and funding for Fierce AIDS Project in LA and the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. And he was a researcher on the hip hop, health in prison, health out of prison for young men in uh, San Quentin prison. Christiana Giordano is an associate professor of anthropology at UC Davis. She received her PhD in anthropology from Berkeley and her MA in philosophy from the University of Pavia, Italy. She works on foreign migration, mental health, the body and cultural translation in contemporary Italy. And her research addresses the politics of migration in Europe through the lens of ethnopsychiatry and its radical critique of psychiatric, legal and moral categories of, it, of inclusion and exclusion of foreign others. And she also works through the lens of research on the human microbiome and migrant health in Europe. Her broader research interests also engage the relation between psychic life, therapy, clinical sites, and images. And she's the author of Migrants and Translation, Caring and the Logics of Difference in Contemporary Italy, which was published by um, University of California Press in 2014 and which was the winner of several uh, awards, including being a finalist for the 2015 Penn Center uh, UC First Book Award. Greg Parati is an assistant professor of dramaturgy and collaborative playmaking at the University of Arizona and an interdisciplinary theater artist. Parati's devised uh, theatrical works include the Laramie Project, the People's Temple and Laramie 10 years later. Greg is an Emmy-nominated co-writer of the HBO teleplay of the Laramie Project, and his work has been seen in venues around the world, including Lincoln Center uh, Theater and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. He has also developed new work at Berkeley Reps, Ground Floor, the Sundance Theater Lab, and uh, Mason Doramar. He's a recipient of the Humanitas Prize, the Will Glickman Award for New Plays, the San Francisco Critics Award, and in addition to his Emmy nomination, he's also been nominated for a New York Drama Desk Award and an Alpert Award for Outstanding Individual Contribution in the Theater. And his long-term collaboration with Christiana investigates the intersection of ethnographic and theatrical writing and research practices. So that's why we've brought them both together. Uh, okay, so I wanna turn it over to the fellows uh, to talk a little bit about their work. And um, we're gonna start with Christiana because she has to run off for uh, oral exams um, not too long after. So um, please, Christiana, take the floor. Thank you so much, Deb, for inviting us at Penn and for introducing us also. Um, we are so excited to be part of uh, your community and also to be part of the um, experimental ethnography conversations and practices. So as Deb mentioned, my interest over the last 20 years um, have been around questions of borders uh, and uh, mental health. Uh, but also I've always been intrigued by different forms of uh, writing and uh, relating to ethnographic material and uh, for various reasons theater has been on my mind maybe it's because i was doing a lot of research in institutional settings and 
I tuned in the theatrical forms of uh, institutional languages, but I've always had um, a particular curiosity for theater as, as a form and scripts as forms. And, um, and seven years ago, uh, Greg and I met at Davis and I was very familiar with the work of Tectonic Theater Project and, and Greg's work in it. And I was interested in the ways in which they were working with empirical material that resembled um, what we call in anthropology ethnographic material, um, like a large vague term nowadays. And, uh, and he and I started collaborating and, and to see what was possible in cross kind of cross pollinating or trying to create uh, a conversation, but not like an intellectual conversation, something that had like an embodied practical, strong practical element. And so since then we've been uh, um, devising workshops and seminars and performances that really bring together our backgrounds and, and what we like doing. And so one of the things that Greg and I did in the last uh, four years is devising two performances at Davis and also in San Francisco at Yerba Buena um, around questions of narrative and borders uh, and uh, mostly what has been going on in the Mediterranean, which is my area of research, also where I'm from originally. And um, we have called these performances unstories uh, uh, with a specific um, desire to question the, the urge to narrate in certain linear ways, um, which is not only the narrative of the state, which is often violently um, linear, but often it's also our academic uh, narrative. And so we've been devising performances and also the seminar that we are offering uh, at Penn. Um, and, you know, we're really um, here to also just talk about it with you. This is my short uh, introduction and Greg can say more from his perspective. And I apologize in advance for having to step out also, which I would have rather stayed with you all, but I have, I had a, just a miscalculation in my calendar and, and an exam I have to be part of. No worries. Um, Greg, do you want to take up from there? Sure, yes. So. Um... Christiana and I have been having a really fruitful generative collaboration ever since we met in Davis. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm currently working on a play about Freddie Gray, who was killed in police custody in Baltimore. And um, <clears throat> there may be some opportunity to hear some of that play at, at a camera event. But I think in terms of what, what I'm bringing to the table at Center for Experimental Ethnography is more to do with um, methodology than content. Um, Christiana and I have been really exploring a lot these practices of narrative and um, the, the practice or the methodology that we're, we're developing is called affect theater. And one of the reasons why we've called it affect theater is because we're really interested in the way that affect works in theatrical events as opposed to or along with narrative so that there's a, a lot of um, exploration in terms of what the affect that's shared between performers and audience is and, and how that can be an actual mode of research. And so um, just to talk a little bit about the, the course that we're offering, um, we're basically working with the elements of the stage, light, sound, costumes, props, and all these things, and kind of bringing those into collision or into interaction with people's uh, research text. So any kind of empirical material that people feel inclined to bring into the workshop and kind of seeing uh, as we present back to spectators, which are the other members of the workshop, uh, 
different short episodes that we create using the elements of the stage and our text to sort of just share material in a way that's not just a straightforward reading or something that's written at our desks. And then what I find particularly exciting about the work is that it's often in the the mistakes or the misinterpretations that the audience feeds back to the people who are presenting that the generative sort of analysis of the material um, emerges, right? So that we start finding out new stuff about our material because people are understanding it, understanding it differently than the way that we're presenting it. And that that conversation between what's presented and what's made up in the mind of the spectator, actually that gap is where new information about the, the empirical material might emerge from. Um, I mean, that's just a little, uh, coconut shell <laughs> description of, of what we're doing in, in, the, in the workshop. I, I wanted to kind of mention what we're doing because there's actually still a little space in the workshop and time for people to join. If there's something else that, you know, uh, you can fit into your schedule, we would love to have you. And um, yeah, I think that's about, about all I, I'll say for the moment. I, I don't want to really talk at people. I'd much rather sort of hear what Kind of curiosities you have and respond to those if that's possible. Great, thanks so much. Ricardo, can you? Uh, yes, your bit? here I go. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I am teaching a class on surrealism in the Americas. Um, part of my um, fellowship, as well as turning my um, silent play, sort of done as a silent film. Um, Mexican Psychotic about the outsider artist Martin Ramirez, who spent about 30 years um, incarcerated in mental asylums in Northern California from about 1930 to 1960, drawing profusely um, and beautifully um, into a short um, experimental video, a sort of puppet show without puppets. And I'm going to read a, a, two short scenes um, called The Revolution Martin, um, and these are the intertitles from the play form version. Here are some scenes from The Revolution You Missed. John Reed, socialist New York journalist, described by Renato de Duc as the simpatico gringo journalist, and who would later document the Russian Revolution to great acclaim and be played by Warren Beatty, first covered the Mexican Revolution for the Metropolitan. These two ensuing scenes are directly quoted from his account, Insurgent, Me Insurgent Mexico. The expulsion of the Spaniards, Villa, which is the Spanish consul, Scoble. I represent the Spaniards. All right, tell them to begin to pack. Any Spaniards caught within the boundaries of the state after five days will be escorted to the nearest wall by the firing squad. The consuls gave a gasp of horror. Villa, cutting them short, the Spaniards must go, Letcher. General, I don't question your motives, but I think you are making a grave political mistake. Villa, Senor Consul, we Mexicans have had 300 years of Spaniards. They have not changed in character since the conquistadores. They disrupted the Indian empire and enslaved the people. We did not ask them to mingle their blood with ours. Twice we drove them out of Mexico. They returned to steal away our land to make the people slaves. They thrust on us the greatest superstition the world has ever known the Catholic Church. They ought to be killed for that alone. Scoble, five days is not enough time to reach all the Spaniards with this news. Then they have 10. Two, on women's suffrage. Read, what do you think of socialism? Via, is it a thing? I only see it in books and I do not read much. Read, and will women vote in your new republic? Via laughs and laughs and laughs. Do you mean elect a government and make laws? Yes, like in the United States. Well, if they do it up there, I don't see that they shouldn't do it down here, but they have no sternness of mind. They are full of pity and softness. Why a woman would not give an order to execute a traitor? I'm not so sure of that, mi general. Women can be crueler and harder than men. Via's wife enters with lunch. Oiga, ven. Last night I caught three traitors crossing the river to blow up the railroad. What shall I do with them? Shall I shoot them or not? Que se yo, you know best. No, I leave it in your hands. 
Oh, well, shoot them. And this I wrote because um, I'm still a practicing poet, sort of in whatever I do. And today is Mexican Independence Day. And I wore my Selena shirt. And this is called Anything for Selena's, which is a quote from the film, and all her people. On this Mexican Independence Day 2021, does the Philadelphia U Penn's Fisher Bennett building precisely? And this is the uh, Grito de Loras. Quote, my friends and countrymen, neither the king nor tributes exist for us any longer. We have borne this shameful tax, which only suits slaves for three centuries as a sign of tyranny and servitude, terrible stain upon which we shall know how to wash away with our efforts. The moment of our freedom has arrived. The hour of our liberty has struck. And if you recognize its great value, you will help me defend it from the ambitious grasp of the tyrants. Only a few hours remain before you see me at the head of the men who take pride in being free. I invite you to fulfill this obligation. And so without a patria nor liberty, we shall always be at a great distance from true happiness. It has been imperative to take this step as now you know, and to begin this has been necessary. The cause is holy and God will protect it. The arrangements are hastily being made. And for that reason, I will not have the satisfaction of talking to you any longer. Long live then the Virgen of Guadalupe. Long live America for which we are going to fight. Death to the Spaniards. Long live independence. Um, Hidalgo, September 16th, 1810. This goes out to all the Mexicans, mi gente, my mass class, the hyper exploited, super sexy, simple and humble, complex and strutting, people who clean all the toilets of the world, grow and pick and salt and spice, the US's crops and bar, restaurant, taco truck food. This goes out to that woman who wakes up before her world does to make tortillas hecho a mano daily. And at least monthly, her husband bounces her off her apartment or adobe walls. This does not go out to that asshole. This goes out to all the badasses and locas and side pieces who don't often work or get to sleep before dawn, but who make art and nightlife and bar fights and breakups happen. This goes out to me and the three other Mexicans who work in this building at my elite job site. Of the four of us, two of us sit behind desks, two stand behind brooms, one has tenure, two have a union. All are my daily materials reality check. This goes out to all the Mexicans in Texas. Hell, actually anyone in Texas, but especially the Mexicans needing, wanting, and are considering an abortion. DM us, set up GoFundMe pages. We are here to aid and abet. What Mexicans know is lawlessness. Bandidos por siglos y por vida. This goes out to the Mexicans who sling ass, shit, loud, cacahuates, flores, bacon wrapped hot dogs, San Marcos blankets, piggy banks, the pinwheel mobiles made from soda cans, Tacos de ojo, lengua, al pastor, carnitas, buche, costilla, risotales, cabachiles. Praise the taquero each and every day. This goes out to every Mexican in ICE detention, not just the innocent children or the queers and trans seeking asylum, not just those caged by Trump, but all inside, including the coyotes, the traffickers. The criminal class is as deserving of rights as those sentimentalized into sainthood. This goes out to every Mexican, even the trifling ones, the sanctimonious ones, the self-hating racist ones who invariably name their darkest fuck daughter Blanca. This goes out to all the Mexicans who live and know that black and brown are one, black and brown are one, black and brown are one, and will go nowhere, get nothing without each other. This goes out to all the Mexicans on the doubly red road, Indianists and Marxists who work to remake and retake and return our labors and land and pleasure. This goes out to every Mexican orgasm, our truest rito, whether whispered or bellowed, self or other induced. This goes out to my Mexican homegirls, especially my actual biological sister, Claudia, and my ride or die, Jen, Deb, Vicky, Joel, Trion, Persephone, Ophelia, who says Mexican with more love and defiance than anyone I know. This goes out to my brothers, the ones given to me by my parents, Beto, Fico, and Gus, and the ones who gained through the classroom, barstool, bedroom, and march, Augie, Netza, Ivan, Rafa, Ubaldo, Javi, Ricky. This goes out to all the Mexicans on this, our Independence Day, and yes, we need to rise up again against states and jefes. This goes out to us, the Mexicans, not from a criollo priest in colonial Mexico, but from a sissy poet in colonial Philadelphia. This goes out to the Mexicans, not in the Lord or grief, though we know and have had our fill of all that for real, for real, but in rabia and love, I love your coming liberation. The Mexicans who refuse to dream gringo land holding, plexified, deracinated dreams. I love the Mexicans. Thank you.
Thank you, Ricardo, a Mexican. <laughs> Great. Well, let's um, let's open it up, and um, you know, normally if we're in a room, there are other kinds of cues that we can see that are people wanting to ask questions. But I guess here we have little yellow hands. Uh, Regina just raised hers, so I will. Um, pass it over to Regina. Was I mistaken? Maybe I was mistaken. Okay, so would anyone like to um, lob an opening gambit? I should say that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about as a former performer is um, this year's real focus on performance and on, uh, you know, the various embodied forms of knowing that you all have invoked in one way um, or another. And I was really um, intrigued by what you said Greg and Christiana about sort of this refusal of narrative and this juxtaposition of affect and narrative. And um, wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. And then I see that Jasmine has a question too, so. Yeah, I wish, I wish, I'm sad that, that Christiana, it looks like she had to leave. It's like my, I only know how to think half, half thoughts, um, but, <clears throat> Uh, so, so Christiana, when, when we first met, introduced me to, to uh, an article that, that we're reading in class in the seminar uh, by Jean Favre Sada called uh, About Participation, where she really questions this practice of um, participant observation. I mean, this is in the early 80s, this was a little more radical to question that back then, I think. But, um, you know, when she talks about uh, how it's, it's impossible to observe while participating and it's impossible to, par to participate while observing. And she describes the experience of going to the Bocage in France and trying to interview people about witchcraft in the Bocage and um, how everyone basically said, there's no witchcraft in the Bocage until somebody told her that she was actually um, bewitched, she'd actually been bewitched, and she couldn't shake this, this feeling that that was true. And she got caught up into kind of the effective environment of witchcraft in the Bocage, and suddenly everyone was talking to her. They were talking to her about being unwitched, they were talking to her about getting bewitched, and she had access to, to all of this empirical material that she hadn't had access to before. And she found that that access came through this kind of, what she describes as getting caught in the field of research rather than watching the field of research. And, and she describes this very kind of scary affect filled experience. And then, and, and she got a lot of information from that. And then she went back to Paris and started to write and found herself sort of taking that information and trying to catch it in these analytical frames to kind of make it make sense for a reader. And she was very dissatisfied with this process. And she, she talked about how she needed to get re-caught in, in her research material as she wrote so that she could write from a place of not understanding, if that makes sense, rather than from these analytical frames. And, and so our research and our, our, our kind of practice is about trying to find ways of getting, getting caught by our empirical material and having an effective experience of it rather than simply narrativizing it, you know, and kind of finding simple, clear stories that are easy to grab onto and follow along. There's comfort in narrative um, and there's lots of good uses of narrative, but, but there's also a way in which we're slightly suspicious of narrative. It's so easy to associate narrative with truth claims, right? That just because a story is clear, it means it's real. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring that tension, like how is narrative useful? How is it problematic? How can affect actually 
help us convey new things about our research that may not be couched so easily in narrative, I think is a good starting answer for that question. Yeah, that's great, that's great, thanks. Um, Jasmine and then TJ. Just in the explanation you gave right now of about a billion more questions, I'm just really excited for the three of you being here today. I feel like I got the short end of the stick because I just finished up my time as a doctoral student at Penn. And I was that student who harassed everyone across the university about why we don't have performance studies. Where are my theater people? Where are my theater ethnographic people? Um, so it's really great that you all are there. Uh, my, I guess, curiosities are around um, this thread that I've heard across all three of you um, that grapples with race and um, the actual populations that are racialized and working within uh, communities that have faced different kinds of racial violence. And um, Greg, just hearing you talk just now about how the, the tensions that you're exploring um, maybe resist the narrative in some ways, um, how are you considering ethical engagements with communities beyond participant observation, like you just said, and um, what are the implications you think of doing this work differently than relying on analytical frames um, for the broader field um, that engages with ethnographic research? That's a great question. And ethics comes up a lot in, in, in the work that we do because, you know, a lot of times people, you know, ha you know take issue or, or are concerned with this idea of, of playing with research material, you know, at like just bringing it in and sharing it with others and, and seeing what happens, especially when there's, you know, injury happening in, in, in communities. And so it's a really, really great question. And I, I don't want to be uh, pithy or glib about it because I feel like it's sort of central to, to my project, you know, uh, about the the I mean he was no one was found guilty of even negligence in the trials for the death of Freddie Gray but I I you know I tend to call it a murder and um you know there's this big kind of glaring problem of me as a man like a white man telling this story of Freddie Gray because of the injury that took place in that community and because of my kind of situation outside of it. And so I don't really know how to resolve that. I know I want to explore this story and I know I want to engage this story. And I know I'm very interested in how police violence happens and how, you know, the structural ways that it happens. But my only kind of recourse that I've found so far in terms of just this one particular situation, my, my, my relationship to this story, is to actually put the ethics or the problem of the ethics into the play itself. So for example, I have a scene where I've made a composite character of all the people who don't want to work with me or don't want to share their stories with me. And I kind of have a series of scenes with this character sort of critiquing my position because the people who want to work with me don't critique my position, right? So, so um, I, I've just made this series of scenes that arcs through the play. Like the first one, for example, is, is this character sort of going through my release form, which talks about ownership and taking people's stories and, and, and using them for personal profit. And we just have a really problematic conversation about that 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 question of ownership, especially when it's the ownership of a white person of a black person's story. And, you know, again, I don't I don't necessarily resolve that problem. I just kind of try to put it center stage. And um, but then, you know, within the workshop itself, uh, ethics come up all the time. And I think that a big question people have in terms of ethics when they bring their own research is that I'm from the theater community, but we're working with mostly anthropology students, is this idea of sharing research because there's a way in which in the theater people share research all the time, but that there's this kind of tradition maybe of like kind of having your own research because you feel like you've established these effective relationships of trust in the field and how do you then put that into the hands of other people um, without relinquishing your responsibility to the, to the person that you've, you've met and talked to. 
And the way that we work with that is by being really clear that, you know, people only share material that they feel comfortable sharing is one thing. But the other thing is, is that there's a kind of, um, like a, a hermetic sort of seal around the work that we do in the class so that the, the point of doing the work is for the, the researcher to get feedback, to get like uh, new information about their research that they might not necessarily have access to if they're just working on it alone, but it's not necessarily to quote unquote, make a play that's shared with the public. That, that's a possibility for some people, but again, that those kinds of ethical questions take a long time to sort out and resolve. I don't know if that's a good beginning to the answer to your question. I, I think that that's a question we'll, we'll keep working with through the entirety of the semester. That's great. I'd love to hear how it unfolds. And if you need to workshop your Freddie Gray piece, I'm based in Baltimore and I'm studying racism, immigration, and citizenship. Um, at we Hopkins. need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. EJ, <clears throat> you have your um, thanks. Thank you everybody for sharing that. That was amazing. Um, really needed some performance stuff. So thanks, Ricardo, especially. I and this question is for you, although it connects to the affect um stuff that we that you were talking about, Greg. But I'm really interested and really intrigued by a lot of your work and how it engages with anger and um, kind of re- revolutionizing, revolutionizing anger again in a moment when anger has been taken over by Trumpian white men or liberal white men and women to kind of aim their victimhood anger against black and brown bodies. I see you really kind of engaging in uh, an anger, revenge, revolutionary, cutting edge kind of stuff, even the, 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 the play that you were um, performing. And I also, you know, if, if I may, you know, I connected to some of your stuff that you, I love your Facebook posts. I'm, a, I'm an ardent fan because you keep, you keep alternating that, the, the, the anger, the revolutionary anger, you know, um, with uh, revolutionary joy. And uh, I, I bringing back the memories of being queer in this country in the 80s and 90s of going out and dancing and, and, and all the DJ sets that you post, which really bring back memories of growing up in the AIDS epidemic as a queer person here. Um, just wondering how you're envisioning anger as, as a methodology also. I just, I'm a big fan and I, I'm kind of engaging in some of that in my own work. So it's very intriguing. Okay. Well, I think it um, links somewhat to what Greg was talking about, about affect. Um, although I'm a little bit wary of the way sort of affect theory has sort of left the left with all the sort of feelings that are sort of those of bourgeois melancholia. Like we, we all are beside ourselves with grief, as Drew Butler likes to say, or, you know, we are all need to rest as all the napping activists are always talking about. And I no. No, <laughs> if, you, if you can do it, then, you know, go out and get it done. Um, and anger as, you know, as animating force in, you know, in a sort of Freudian libidinal way as well. So yes, there's all that sex to be had. And, you know, I'm a trained dietitian, so there has to be that pleasure with that protest, um, that frisson that, you know, makes, makes it all possible. Um, and so I think in Mexican psychotic, it's putting um, sort of, you know, Martin Ramirez was obsessive in creating these drawings that the asylums that he was in would burn daily because they thought, well, one, they misdiagnosed him as having tuberculosis. And two, they thought that tuberculosis could be passed by paper. Both things were untrue. He didn't have tuberculosis and it's, it's not transmittable that way. So they would burn them. So he would hide them on his person. He would make the paper out of um, like the slips of for their prescriptions and the paper cups they gave them to have their pills. Um, sort of, sort of how how the how you craft the world when you've been taken away from it. And I really want to sort of oppose the sort of I always want to oppose Foucault, but his thesis in *Madness and Civilization* that you know those mad are outside you know, a civilized and civilizing world. Um, and so they let us know, be saying, I mean, um, incarceration in a mental asylum, and that's what it was called, um, in particularly in the depression when he first went in, was where people went in the way in which, you know, black and brown and poor white bodies are 
being caged and jailed in prisons temporarily. It just particularly in um, the sort of the border states between the north and the south the, uh, and the southwest, you know, they would do hobo sweeps or, you know, people who had finished doing the railroads, which Martin Ramirez came to this country to do, they would grab them up and just, you know, throw them in these asylums and, and basically put on movies and drug them and do lots of experimentation on them. So I think that that links to sort of the work you're doing, you know, here with carceral affected communities and what you're doing in India. And we should all have proper anger about that. Yeah, I mean, rage and frustration are such productive animating forces for creative work. I can't even think about like, oh, if I'm in a moment of bliss on the dance floor or something like that doesn't easily translate into something new, right? So somehow that's the thing. Well, in a way you've obliquely um, kind of addressed uh, a question in the chat um, about um, affect. Uh, and I wonder, Anthony Ada, I'm not sure if I've said your name right. I wonder if you want to say more about what you are interested in asking. Oh, um, well, I would just, uh, okay, so I was in here from the beginning of the session. I was in class, um, but I came in at the point where the gentleman in red uh, was talking, was using exactly those terms, uh, getting caught in the affect of, you know, uh, the subject, I assume, uh, in that particular research. And I was wondering about um, what does he think uh, about opportunities? And I think he sort of referenced, made, sort of referenced this when he was talking about the ethics of doing his kind of work. Um, what does it mean, for instance, when uh, a white male goes into a community uh, to do research and is to use this language uh, and he's caught in the affect of the event. And so my question is, is he curious about the fact that he always has this access, but that subject does not have the same kind of access? Yes, I think that's central to the question that we're exploring in the work that we're doing. You, you didn't meet my collaborator, Christiana, but we're, we're doing this work together. But I think, I mean, it's very, very um, heightened in, in our culture right now, this particular schism between me as a researcher and the community that I'm working with. But I think that, that the people who have access to being caught are us on this call, right? That, that we're, we're people who go into communities and we have a certain amount of privilege and power as anthropologists or theater makers. And that, that, that inevitably creates some kind of distance between us and the the field of research that we're trying to explore and we're also you know many of us not from those particular fields so um yeah like how do i actually you know engage with my field of research in a way that's useful and generative when i'm coming from a position of privilege that certain people in the field that I'm I'm researching don't have access to. And the the methodology or the practice of research that we're trying to develop is, you know, a way of grappling with those questions. But um, inevitably, everybody that I encounter in the field has a different experience of me as a white man. And I'm going to have a different experience based on what is coming back from them effectively. And I have to navigate those processes every time that I, that I engage with an interlocutor. But I, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly curious about it. And I'm also, I'm also really curious about, um, I mean, this isn't necessarily to your question, but, but a way in which um, I've experienced in the anthropological community, this notion that that writing like at our desks is somehow more innocent than 
creating performances out of the research that we're gathering, right? That there's this way in which putting a body on the line to perform some kind of ethnographic research is somehow more suspect than engaging in narrativizing or, or just, just writing about our research experience. So um, yeah, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have definitive like responses to many of these questions, but I feel like it's it's the very heart of kind of what we're trying to explore and the research that we're doing. So I don't know if that's a helpful response. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm glad as you said that you know it's at the core of your thinking or your reflection. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Who else would like to enter the free? I mean, I think one of the things that um, you all are hitting on in different ways is, uh, you know, the questions that really, I think all of us who do research with people, you know, which I would broadly define as ethnographic research, <laughs> you know, if we're like hanging out and learning in a collaborative and participatory way with each other and from each other, that everybody is really forced to confront um, the various ways in which we're implicated in the broader systems that we're critiquing, you know, and the various complicities I think that we have uh, within those systems as well. And it's kind of that constant, um, that constant interrogation that keeps things lively also, <laughs> you know, and keeps us all, um, growing more deeply in relation with each other and growing in, in our knowledge of, you know, some understanding of a human condition. I don't know if Ricardo, you have anything to say about these things? Well, other than I agree with what you just said, but I wanted to sort of this idea of sort of getting caught and the privileges around affect, I guess um, my response would be defy, defy, defy. I'm teaching um, surrealism in the Americas and you'll find that the sort of the artists are either of two classes. They either come from working class backgrounds like someone like the, the poet John Giorno or they come from the bourgeoisie or even the noblesse oblige like Leonora Carrington was going to be presented to King George and instead at 19, she set her sights on Max Ernst, who was 47 years old, broke up his marriage, had a fist fight in public with his wife and took off with him to France. Um, and whose family nickname was Prim. <laughs> um, and then that set her course. Um, so the play that I'm um, producing of hers at the ICA Halloween weekend um, is a record of her experience of being um, in the women's liberation movement in Mexico City. Uh, although it's a situation, I agreed to do the play and I got the rights before actually reading the play. Um, and it's a situation in, in the future, in a dystopia, where all the women have died from a, uh, an airborne plague. Um, and the, the, one of the first things that happens is all the nurses die. So there was all this resonance with COVID. Um, but there's only one woman who remains and she's the madam of a brothel and an old obese crone. Um, and she stares at an ostrich egg while she battles the patriarchy in the form of the Pope, 12 cannibals, three astronauts, Superman, Hitler. Um, and she, she wins. <laughs> um, um, and so that, yeah, I think that part of that is, um, is defying those privileges. And also I think that thing about sort of this has been my frustration in, you know, moving to Philadelphia and then the whole world shutting down that I remain a tourist here. I'm unused to not being in and of making my art in the community that I absolutely belong to, that I'm both um, held by and beholden to. Um, and I think if you can get to that place, um, the other things don't seduce as much. Yeah. 
Um, well, you mentioned the pandemic and um, Kim has a question in the chat. Kim, do you want to voice it instead of me being your ventriloquist or would you prefer? Um, my my um, connection is not good. So if you don't hear me, Deborah, please take over. Um, very simply that during the pandemic, um, what you said resonated with me because of because of the things that I encounter. In fact, in one of my presentations, there was an expectation that, oh, you propose doing such rich ethnographic work, where is the ethnography? And my point was that during the pandemic, I didn't have the permission to, to express what people were feeling. And I needed to go back to them, I still do, to go back to them to get permission to, to use that material. But in essence, what I was getting were conversations that were deeply personal. And I wonder if you have encountered something similar uh, in your uh, research and performance, either during the pandemic or at other similar times of community or personal disruption and crisis. Thank you. I'll go, I guess, then Greg. Um, well, this is my third plague. I guess in my lifetime, I went through the drug roars as a child, like, you know, the batarams that they made to knock down crack houses used to drive by my high school in LA. Um, and then, you know, I'm, oh, I get out of, you know, a world where, you know, two thirds of the boys I went to, um, you know, elementary school with were dead by the time I was 19. Um, and then I'm in my 20s and I'm an out homosexual and I'm gonna take over the world and then AIDS. Um, so um, I'm on, I, it, it felt different that this affected everyone. <laughs> so that it just it wasn't, you know, my enraged pocket of the world. Um, it is innervating as someone who worked in public health for 15 years, the way we're doing this, um, the way we are not absolutely making vaccination compulsory, um, the weird pen policy of privacy in relating to students, like, no, this is our collective health and good. Um, in, you know, and in the same way terminations of pregnancies are, in the same way HIV prevention is. Um, and I wish we were doing, I mean, China has zero cases of COVID and there are a billion people there. <laughs> like, let's, we need to look at that. Um, so, um, and then just in terms of art, like, you know, I just spent a lot of time in my bedroom writing haikus because, you know, it can be like, you know, a distracting and focused practice. Um, but I'm ready to, th that's why I have now three sort of publicly engaged, collectively um, driven projects going. Because I, I want the world back and I want it to be of it and in it. Uh, it's such a great question. You know, I, um... I, yes, is the answer. I have really run into some, some big issues that have come up for me because of COVID. And, and um, so right before COVID happened, I got really sick. And so I, I, I was out for like almost eight months from my research. And, you know, I mean, I have insurance, I survived and, you know, everything was fine in the end, but then, then COVID happened. And um, that also, created an obstacle for me in terms of my field of research. I couldn't get to Baltimore. And I think the thing that I've really struggled with a lot is, yeah, I got really sick, but I was able to kind of go forward in my life, you know, and, and kind of, you know, I had insurance that covered all the costs and all that stuff. Um, so in a way I was able to kind of go offline and be okay with that. But a lot of the people that that I engaged with in the field, especially in Freddie Gray's neighborhood, didn't get a break like that. And and um, so I it's a, it's a place where I feel incredibly conflicted that that um, I kind of lost the thread with certain people that I that I was in touch with. You know, one woman, I can't find her number anymore because her cell phone number ended and I can't find anyone who who knows her, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, where I feel like certain people are, you know, just so not taken care of by the structures that are in place. 
and that I was able to be taken care of through through that period of separation and that it's created an actual schism between me and a few of my my interlocutors just I, I, I can't find them and that feels really bad to me I mean I, I don't really know how to resolve that you know I'm keeping looking but um that that's the big ethical dilemma that I have around COVID is that it's separated me from from people that I feel like have been have had to cope with COVID going forward in ways that I haven't been able to see or know. I wonder if you each could give us a little bit of a sneak peek of, um, or a little bit more about a, a, of a sneak peek of um, what you think you might present to us or do with us um, in December for your final events. I mean, Ricardo, you were talking about an adaptation to film with puppetry, but no puppets. And uh, Greg, I know you and Christiana are still thinking about it and maybe stuff will come out of the class, maybe stuff will come out of the workshops. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Do you wanna? Sure, I'll go. Um, yeah, I really, I mean, so I staged, when I wrote the play, I um, originally did it in a residency with Mabu Minds, the experimental theater company um, in downtown New York. And so it was structured as a silent play. So with actors, sort of sound Foley artists on the side um, and intertitles, and then a giant altar that I had built um, for Marthe Mamiras just to bring in that Mexican touch. Um, and then in the film version, I, I want to play with sort of those little puppet theaters that go up in like parks. Um, but yes, but just sort of hands and torsos. I have a tattoo of Martin Ramirez here. So like, I'm gonna find some actor who will make out with it. Um, so I mean, if that's like, if that's a note I really want to do, um, you know, um, all consensual, of course. And then, you know, there's a, there's some punching bag things that are gonna happen, like to play off of Punch and Judy. So I wanna play with like, you know, puppetry as form, but then the sort of surreal effect of removing the puppet and just the, the, the labor of, of the hand. Um, and also because his art drawing, you know, is a hand-based art. So linking all of that into technique. Great. Yeah, and for us, I think I think we really want for uh, whatever we do present to be material that emerges from the seminar. I mean, we're we're discussing some some readings in the seminar, but primarily we're making things, and so our hope is just that um, there's material that each of the grad students who's made stuff is interested in sharing, and then we'll probably couple that with some kind of conversation about you know the methodologies that we've used to create that work. Um, the other thing to say is that you know things really change fast in the class, you know, because of the analysis and the conversation and the editing we do on the fly. So it would all it wouldn't be a show; it would be more like a series of theatrical episodes that people are performing with script in hand and you know we're all manipulating the, the elements of the stage moving lights you know changing and, and so it's kind of a like a glorious mess you know and um but and then hopefully we would want to reproduce um some of the analysis that that happens where we would ask the audience to actually feedback to us what things mean or you know what they took away from it because that kind of um you you're not really in charge or control of that you can just offer and then what you get back often and in, in, you know will teach the students even more about their research is the hope yeah sort of like a lecture demonstration um, yeah. feedback session yeah that would be great um does anyone else have any uh, sort of- I have a question. I'd love to pipe in. 
Hi guys, thanks so much for presenting and uh, telling us a bit about more your work. And I think now we've kind of moved into, this is a good segue, because my question has to do more with teaching. You guys both engage performance so much in your work. And I just want to hear more about how you guys envision the role of the teacher and what the classroom environment is like for you guys and how, how you bring these lessons um, while performing as a teacher, how you bring these lessons about performance to your students and what, what kind of role you guys take in the very- I'm running my, so I'm running my surrealism in the Americas class sort of as a, as a Marxist study group combined with a seance, if that makes, if that makes surreal sense. So that's exactly, that's what I'm doing. I want to go to that. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, and we're we're basically working in the way that I described that we'll present. So we we spend a lot of time uh, at the beginning of each class, uh, kind of getting into the different elements of the stage. So we might spend a half an hour, like exploring how light communicates. You know what light actually does or says to the audience watching, and then we might explore sound and how you know, we might have existing moments that were made the week before and we might layer sound into them to have some kind of conversation about how the affect of sound re-narrates whatever we saw last week and makes up new stories. So we're, we're constantly looking at um, the kind of structural analysis of a moment, like you walked in, you turned the light on, you turned your head to the right, and then you dropped a ball on the floor. That's a structural analysis. And then the relationship of that to an interpretive analysis, which is like you were a six-year-old child at your birthday party and you were playing with a ball, right? And, and, and looking at the ways that, you know, what we see phenomenologically gets translated into a set of signs and stories that we make up for ourselves. And then we're also, um, you know, reading related affect theory and different other kinds of texts. We read, read our article last week about the method, which I'm happy to share with anyone who's curious about it. Um, and so we spend a little bit of time talking at the end of each class, sort of, and I think that that's helpful for certain students to kind of find like some frame into which they can put the work that we're making, but primarily we're looking at these, um, this kind of translation that audiences make between what they actually see, the combinations of elements on the stage and, and why they make up the things that they do in their heads about what that means. Thanks, and, and I'd love to hear more about the seance, like the spiritism plus structural Marxism, could you? <laughs> Not plus structuralism, just Sorry. straight up Marxism. <laughs> bringing back from the dead. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't know, um, definitely sort of whatever was in Leonora Carrington's cauldron. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, 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 we haven't delved into what the, we played Exquisite Corpse in our first group session last week, and I made them create scenes between the various monsters and creatures. So we, we, we will see. It will be a very brave new world. Well, great. Um, unless anybody puts up a hand, I will uh, say that I think this is moving toward its natural, um, evolution and I will thank everybody for coming and especially thank Ricardo and Greg and Christiana for introducing themselves to the broader community. Um, and uh, just before signing off, I also want to uh, let everybody know, and of course you'll get reminders about this as we get closer, that our second and third third Thursdays are actually going to happen on the second Thursdays because of conflicts with other events. So October 14th and November 11th. Um, and you will get information about all of that if you are on our list or if you check our website. So thank you everybody for coming and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.